I have a one woman show called From Southern Belle to Mrs. Cartel. <laughs> uh, I uh, erroneously uh, married uh, when I was very young, a member of the Cali Cartel and didn't know it. <laughs> Um, oh my god! Yeah, so that was a thing. How like did as you, you get do, out of that? as you do, <laughs> you know, if you've heard that story once, you've heard it a thousand times. Oh the girl god. that meets a member of the Cali Cartel doesn't know it and marries him. Welcome to Persister with Candace Lowry. I am Candace Lowry. What is a persister? A persister is a little play on words of nevertheless she persisted, but also a woman who has truly broken through that glass ceiling and has really forged a path and a name for herself in whatever business she's in. Persister with Candace Lowry is a Castbox original produced alongside Studio 71. Castbox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on both both iOS and Android, where you can find all of your favorite podcasts. You can listen to Persister with Candace Lowry wherever you get your podcasts, but I hope you'll give CastBox a shot because I think it's the best. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Persister with Candace Lowry. I am Candace Lowry, and I am so excited to not only have Donna Thomas here, but have her little dog, <laughs> Dorothy. <laughs> Dorothy. And um, she's going to be joining us as well. But I feel like there are so many things I want to touch on with you from being like this badass businesswoman in entertainment to kind of fulfilling this need to have uh to give back Mm -hmm. um but also touch the me too movement as well so um, yeah so right now you're the svp of sales at viewbiquity correct right and you came from uh technicolor right right um yes (laughs) i came from technicolor before that um but i've been in the media and entertainment industry since college so Mm -hmm. Uh, just this last probably 10 years have been on kind of the post, post-production post side mm-hmm. um, and the finishing side, but in content mm-hmm. since the very beginning. So Ubiquity is, you might have never heard of Ubiquity, but they're a, we're a distribution company that now does you know post-production and finishing, and I deal with all the studios, so they brought me in to develop relationships with the studios mm. and bring uh, business into the company. <laughs> yeah, because I saw it kind of works with rights and where it can stream uploading things like that which i feel like is becoming a bigger and bigger business now yeah because of all the streaming companies correct correct so if you look at like kind of the kind of the life of a of a title if you will mm-hmm. um you know it goes into pre-production and production and then there's the finishing work and then that that goes to its first place whether it be theatrical or you know first run on fx or mm-hmm. whatever it may be but then that's an asset that they, the company or the content owner then sells to, could be a number of distributors globally. So we we do all of that. We, we do the film finishing, we take the title, and we distribute it to over 1,400 people globally. And it's all digital media, supply chain. <laughs> it's not sexy. Yeah. <laughs> but, it's, but it's important. <laughs> but it's important. So, like, for example, if, um, let's just say, like, a Toy Story, uh, wants to get on Netflix or Hulu, how do they decide which streaming platform to go on to? Well, I think if you have content and you're wanting to to monetize it, Mm -hmm. then you're going to want that content to be every place possible, Mm -hmm. right? So bigger content providers do their own content deals. Um, So it's not unusual. I've got a big content provider right now that I'm working on launches with Netflix, Amazon, iTunes, Mm YouTube TV, and a number of other people, and they're launching 2,000 titles, kind of their library, all at one time, because they want that content to be on every single platform. Mm -hmm. There's a cost associated with that, and pretty steep ones sometimes, uh, just for preparing the content Mm. and getting it up on the platform, because it's not like preparing it once. It's like this whole complex um, system we've created for ourselves. Right. And... um, it's, it's hard to monetize your content. Now, if you're a small content provider, you have like an independent film or something like that, you would probably need somebody like uh, Lack of Ubiquity that mm. licenses content mm. for the content provider and then makes it available on different platforms. So, you know, we offer services to, you know, the big giant studios and then little people trying to figure out how to get their work seen, yeah. you know? Well, I always get excited when I hear about these great films that were at like 
the Venice Film Festival or things like that, and I can't find them in theaters. But then when they finally get on Netflix or something, I'm mm-hmm. so excited because yeah. I can finally see them. It's true. It's it's, it's tough out there. It, yeah. it, distribution is uh, distribution is the name of the game. You know whether you're trying to get your show sell a show mm-hmm. to a network that then has availability to you know hundreds of millions of people or you're an independent content creator that's trying to get your stuff seen you know you put it up on vimeo you know yeah. some people might watch it um you do the festival circuit <laughs> I, I also make films so yeah. yeah we've got a horror f- film that's in the festival circuit right now so you do the festival um circuit and then what does that mean yeah you know what do you do with you that for people to buy it right? yeah acquire yeah. it <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so you, I'm interested because this almost feels like a job that has gotten bigger as time's gone on. And so when you, you went to school in Georgia, right? right? So what did you initially want to do that brought you out to L.A.? Okay. So, <laughs> uh, so honestly, I did not have kind of aspirations necessarily of being in the entertainment industry Mm -hmm. even though i was in pageants (laughs) oh my god southern pageant girl yes oh Uh, i grew up in texas and my mom's grew up in texas with southern pageant girl (laughs) Uh, yes and i have a uh also i don't know if you saw my bio i have a one woman show called from southern bell to mrs cartel (laughs) uh i uh, erroneously uh married uh when i was very young a member of the cali cartel and didn't (laughs) know it um, oh my god! Yeah, so that was a thing. How like did as you, you get do, out of that? as you do, <laughs> you know, if you've heard that story once, you've heard it a thousand times. Oh the girl god. that meets a member of the Cali Cartel doesn't know it and marries him. Um, so actually, what what had happened was I was I was married to him, and um, not because he was a Cali Cartel member, but because of another reason, his violence and other things. It was not a fun time. Uh, I had left him, and. One of the things, I was still in college, and one of the things that he had done uh, while we were married is he sent me to school to learn Word Perfect and Lotus One Two Three. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I'm like, you know, I'm an independent woman, you know, so I'm going to get a temp job. So uh-huh. serious, true story. I got a temp job at Discovery Channel. Oh, whoa. And it was a satellite office in Atlanta, and I was working 20 hours a week and, uh, you know, doing lotus one two three (laughs) and and i was just getting my bearings back and like you know getting excited about life again and you know three weeks into that job they came to me and said we're closing the office and i remember you know you have these times in your life where you know they're defining moments kind of like a sliding doors thing it's going to go one way or the other yeah and that that voice inside of us knows maybe we don't know what to do with it but we know Mm -hmm. and you know as awful as uh, those are stories for another day but as awful as that situation was this was to me was like this is devastating and I just knew I was in my home and couch in the dark and I was like if I don't get a job there I'm never going to be able to change the trajectory of my life mm. I just knew so I put my suit on with my shoulder pads and you know my mall bangs and I went in the next day and my boss at the time her name's Kim Martin she was a uh, also a pageant girl from Middle, <laughs> Milledgeville, Georgia. I just a little bit, to go <laughs> yep, a little bit older than me. And um, I said, so not confidently, confidently, um, will you move me too? And she laughed and she said, you don't work here. You're a temp. <laughs> and I took that opportunity to make this impassioned plea. I, I don't exactly remember the exact words I said, but I was like, please believe in me and take a chance on me. I swear to you, you will never regret it. Mm. And... It wasn't until years later, after I wrote the show, that I asked her why, but yeah. she did. And, and she got me a job. I didn't even have a job. I was a temp. Got me a job as an administrative assistant, and they paid to move me wow. to D.C., which I can't imagine what a lottery win for me. But, yeah. but I also asked, and I fought for what I wanted. And I got up there, and then with six years, I was senior vice president <laughs> of affiliate sales and marketing. So it's insane. I often say to Kim, um, she's the only person that really met Mark, the Columbia drug lord in my uh, adult life. <laughs> the drug lord. Uh, and I said, uh, I often say to her when I see her, thank you, you know, for saving my life and thank you for changing my life. And she always says, I didn't save your life. You did. But it's two things for success. It's mm-hmm. it's one finding an environment that values what you bring to the table right if i 
Wharton, if Discovery at that time valued Wharton MBAs, mm-hmm. and we only hire Wharton MBAs or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, people from Harvard, whatever it may be, then that would not have been a place where I could have thrived because mm-hmm. that wasn't my situation. Mm-hmm. But at that time in the industry, um, the Discovery in particular was a place that you could try new things, you could learn and grow, and you could just kind of move and create, not create your own destiny. You had to you know, work hard and do the right things. But it's finding a company or a person that believes in you and the value that you bring, and then just working harder than everybody else. Mm-hmm. And it's not that hard to work harder than everybody else. It really isn't. It I've isn't. noticed that. <laughs> it isn't. And the amount that people complain about Never things. say it's not my job. Yeah. Never, never say it's not my job. You know, the trajectory of going from an administrative assistant to senior vice president in that short of a period of time was phenomenal. And it was Mm -hmm. a great experience. And I left because um, one of my mentors who had been the COO of Charter Communications was starting a streaming company in Atlanta. Mm. And she had investors. Um, And so, and I'm from Georgia, so Mm -hmm. I wanted to go back home. And I, when I left to go there, I remember being on phone with clients at times. Um, I think of the world as phone, 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 <laughs> phone, you know, phone, phone, uh, phone, <laughs> phone, phone, <laughs> phone. Um, like, what is this thing you're doing? I'd be like, I can't hear you. Because I didn't know what streaming media was. Yeah. And um, then 9-11 happened and the investors shut the door like they did on many companies. Mm-hmm. And Discovery's owned by a company, Liberty Media, out of, um, it's a big media company. And they asked me to come out to California to work for Ascent Media, Mm. who was years later sold to Deluxe. So I came out to work for Ascent Media in just kind of business strategy and development. And, you know, a couple years into that, um, there was an issue with a studio and that needed someone to handle it that knew how to handle a customer experience. And my boss at the time, Jose, he's uh, he was the CEO of Ascent. Um, he said, he passed away very young with uh, cancer. He was a wonderful human. He's just like, I don't care if you don't know this, but you know how to take care of a customer. So that's how I was assigned and, and got into kind of the digital media space mm-hmm. as it relates to post-production. And like, I didn't know what an encode was. I didn't know what a transcode was. Yeah. I thought a fig was a fruit, but it's French, <laughs> French, Italian, German, Spanish. <laughs> you know, I knew nothing. But every day when I talked to Paramount every morning, and we still do it because the guy, the gentleman at Paramount is my producing partner now for mm. our independent movies. And I, every day I would call him and I would say, good morning, Mike. It's a brand new day and no PO, no delivery. <laughs> and every day, you know, we just rebuilt that relationship. Yeah. And. I learned a, a lot of technical information, and I'm not a technical person, but I learned about workflows, and I learned, you know, kind of this new space, and I'm lucky that I did so, mm-hmm. because if you're not growing and you're not learning something new, you, you just, you're not evolving. Mm-hmm. And I will tell you, I'm a confident person, but I felt stupid for about two years in every meeting. Mm-hmm. I, my, fr- my best friend, she works with me now, Carrie, we were talking about it yesterday on the, we were over at Lionsgate yesterday, and we were coming home, and we were thinking about a meeting we were in about six years ago with DreamWorks, and it was an area of the business, like color grading and stuff. We didn't know much about it at the time. And he used so many acronyms in that meeting. We're like, mm-hmm, you yes. Just fake mm-hmm. it. <laughs> sure. Mm-hmm. Yes, thank you. You know, we, no idea what he said. Yeah. The whole meeting. But you could easily say, shame on this company for not teaching me, or like, hey, I, you know, I can't do my job, you know, because I don't know all these things. But no, it's your life is in your hands. It's entirely up to you to to go for what you want to do and learn what you need to learn to do your job. Yeah, and you bring up a good point of being like wanting to be challenged. And I remember when I was working at BuzzFeed, it was this shock that I was leaving. And I kind of got to a point where I felt comfortable and complacent and I wanted something new to do that was challenging and people didn't really understand that. And I think that sometimes people are afraid to move because that means it's something new and it might be a risk, but it it sounds like that it's so worth it because you're learning so much more. Yeah. And and I've really loved working in the the entertainment uh, the entertainment industry. Like I said, I didn't have aspirations of of doing so, um, but being a pageant person and then also <laughs> drama in high school. Yeah. Um, 
you know, it was something that I always wanted to do. And I, I tried my hand at stand up uh, in New York a while back. Um, even though I didn't live in New York, I was in New York all the time for business. And, and then I just got so busy with life. I didn't really, you know, pursue it again until I moved to LA mm -hmm. proper. Cause I lived in San Diego for about eight years, but, and, and worked in LA and it commuted. But, um, then I felt like I wasn't fearless anymore. Like mm -hmm. I had gotten complacent. And I'm like, I went to circus school. I'm terrible. <laughs> what? Yeah. I love how we've learned so far. Circus school, yeah. ex-cartel. Yeah, life. circus school, I'm terrible. <laughs> you know, the lira is not for me. It's for <laughs> tiny, Humans. little people. Um, I can't climb a rope. You know, not like yeah. clown school, but actual, like, do the acrobatic stuff. Oh, that stuff is hard. Yeah, I learned. <laughs> And um, I had bruises in the back of my legs, and somebody from work said, who did that to you? I'm like, Alira. Me. <laughs> I did it. Um, but then I took an improv class, and thinking, you know, this will be, you know, something fun to do just to get myself back out there. And then it kind of ended up being something that I was passionate about. Um, I'm an advocate that every business person should take an improv class mm -hmm. because it teaches you, like, the tenets of teamwork and saying yes and, you know, thinking outside the box. And if, you're, if your teammate – steps out and does something ridiculous instead mm -hmm. of being like look at that idiot you know it's like oh let Working me with let them. me make what you did look brilliant <laughs> yeah. yeah instead of like look at dum dum <laughs> you know so when uh, the one thing that i've noticed in just in the brief time i've been in entertainment is that at some companies i get to they are so open and welcoming to all races genders everything but at a certain point i notice it kind of stops and it just becomes like all men and I think that it has definitely opened my eyes recently and a lot of other women I work with sometimes feel that way and we want to to break I mean there is truly that glass ceiling and so I'm wondering since you know you're up there and you've made it how you know what advice you'd give to a young woman who is kind of discouraged by seeing that at her company um ugh. <laughs> I'm discouraged because um, diversity is something that's been talked about for a long time. And I remember mm, maybe 10 years ago, so not that long ago, um, diversity was talked about as a um, as a subject. And I was part of this women's leadership group. Mm -hmm. And one of the executives at a big media company was like, what do you well, of course we have diversity. I mean, look at our marketing department, mm -hmm. our customer service department. No, that's not what we're talking about. Right. We're talking about, you know, representation. I, I've, it dawned on me recently, I was invited to a meeting that, for some reason, I was invited to it, and I really shouldn't have been there. <laughs> I think it was an accident. But I went in, and it was mainly men. It was a money meeting. So mainly men, mainly men in their, white men in their 60s, and the things that they were talking about, you know, like high, high, high-level corporate um, issues, I'm like, Oh, this is why representation matters, because what we think about, like our problems on a mm -hmm. daily basis, even if they're very important problems to the corporation, it's nothing compared to the conversations that are happening at that level in right. corporate America or that level in politics or that level of academia. It, it kind of doesn't matter. Right. Um, and I, I honestly think from my perspective that I thought like there's a time when you can get to a point in your career where you can walk into a room. And a man in particular, because that's what we're talking about, mm -hmm. will realize, oh, she's a senior vice president. She has to have value. Like, even mm -hmm. if I didn't know her before now, like she has uh, good thoughts and good opinions and things to bring to the table. I should listen to her. And in many ways, it's still like, oh, we let you in the room. We didn't mean for you to talk, mm -hmm. you know, and and I have a good career. But yeah. these are the, still the things that. You know, people who don't mean to um, that, you know, tell you that shh, the men are talking or um, really recently in a meeting, a, a, another female exec was like, you know, it was really cold in that meeting. And a man exec said, oh, are you menopausal? Which is like, oh, my God, like, I mean, oh. or when you don't get something done and you, you have to complain about it as a woman, like. Hey, yeah. John. I mean, I know you're busy, mm -hmm. but I mean, would you mind if it, I mean, if you have a minute, mm -hmm. you know, versus like John that was supposed I to deliver that. yesterday. Why isn't it that way? I had an issue recently, kind of similar to that. I for nine weeks nothing happened, and finally I sent a stern email, 
and I'm told that my histrionics are unappreciated. Like, would you talk to a man that way? You know, and this is something that I love, right? So you're never going to, I don't think we're ever going to eradicate it. Yeah. So I think that, you know, you can, you can complain or you can, you can raise, you know, holy hell, which depending on your mood that day or your, your level of being exhausted, having to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Um, Or you figure out how to, to change the system from the inside and do the best you can. Um, I think a part of diversity and part of getting to where you are is people in those rooms don't understand Mm. that they are what bringing another voice and perspective would mean because you do hire people who are like you. Mm -hmm. And so unless you make a concerted effort to hire, you know, diverse voices, it's not going to happen. Yeah. You know, yeah. But for people who are discouraged by it. And, you know, like I go home and I, you know, eat a pint of ice cream or, you know, I listen, somebody told, you know, somebody told me recently uh, as if they were Jesus giving me a parable. They said, Donna, listen, I once had a female friend at work that um, was having uh, trouble with a male colleague. And I told her, listen, I get it that history probably brought you here, but If your button were smaller, he'd be less likely to push it. So you should probably shrink your button. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, my gosh. This is so bad. I can let you read the text. (laughs) And and to be, like you said, like to be a bad, I am a badass. But then also I'm a sweet southern lady. So like I I get back to my office and I read this to my two office mate. One's a guy. one's, And I'm like, is this offensive? And they were like, yes. Yes. And this is a good guy that's in it. I think he was trying to help. (laughs) And so we made shirts that said shrink your button. But. Oh, God. (laughs) Well. This is fascinating, interesting, um, helpful. And so, so I maybe wanna... I'm telling people that the world is horrible and, no. you know, <laughs> that there's no hope. <laughs> no. There's but, always hope. Um, I want to take a quick break really fast and then get back into it and talk about more of your experiences and how you're kind of breaking through that as well. So we'll be right back. Falls in full swing at ModCloth. If you're not already curled up in a sweater, like me, they've got you covered with cozy essentials and cute knits that won't quit. ModCloth has tons of stylish outerwear that is sure to make an impression. Feeling festive? Be sure to check out their holiday gift guide featuring unique finds and perfect prezzies for everyone on your list, yourself included. Prep for those upcoming holiday parties with Mod Claus Party Boutique. Discover everything from sheer lace to luxe velvet to irresistible sparkle. It's sure to be a night to remember and an outfit you will never forget. Mod Cloth believes fashion should celebrate all women. That's why they offer a full range of sizes from extra extra small to 4X. Got questions about fit? Their team of mod stylists can hook you up with complimentary sizing and styling to help. I personally love Mod Cloth because the material and everything that you get just feels good and it feels very well made. Um, but I also love the fact that they have year round rompers and jumpsuits because that's who I am and that's what I wear constantly. Um, so that's my thing. But they also have very unique clothes and very unique patterns. So they're always conversation starters. So I will definitely be getting some velvet jumpsuits from the site, especially for Christmas. And I might get some sweaters because I just love dressing like I'm basically in pajamas every day. To get 15% off your purchase of $100 or more, go to M-O-D-C-L-O-T-H dot com and enter code PERSISTER at checkout. Once again, that's modcloth.com slash P-E-R-S-I-S-T-E-R at checkout. This offer is valid for one-time use only and expires February 2nd, 2019. Okay, I want to talk about LinkedIn here. So the right hire can make a huge impact on your business, and that's why it's so important to find the right person. But where do you even find that individual? You could try posting on job boards, but can you really be sure the right person sees your job? Instead, find the person who will help you grow your business with LinkedIn. And I have gotten 
all of my jobs off of LinkedIn. And it has been incredibly important for my career growth. And as the world's largest professional network, people go to LinkedIn every day to grow professionally and discover job opportunities. And 70% of the US workforce is already there. LinkedIn Jobs matches people to your role based on more of who they really are. So their skills, interests, and even how open they are to new opportunities. Which is great because sometimes when I'm looking, I'll just mark myself as open. (laughs) This way, your job gets seen by more of the right people. Most LinkedIn members haven't recently visited the top job boards, but 9 out of 10 members are open to new opportunities. So you can only reach them on LinkedIn. That's why a new hire is made every 10 seconds using LinkedIn. And businesses rate LinkedIn 40% higher than job boards at delivering quality candidates. So hurry up to linkedin.com slash persister and get $50 off your first job post. That's linkedin.com slash persister, P-E-R-S-I-S-T-E-R, to get $50 off your first job post. LinkedIn.com slash persister. Terms and conditions apply. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Persister. I have Donna Thomas with me, and I feel like I am learning a lot right now about oh. just, I don't know. I, I I run into this, even though I don't want to fall into the stereotype, I still have a problem being confrontational. And like you said, like, I don't want to say not taking no for an answer, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Is not necessarily seeing a missed opportunity as just that, you right. know? And yeah. it it feels like having that representation is so important. And it's just so frustrating because it's like, why is it so hard to get there? You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, just regular rules apply on you going for your dreams and doing the best you can and waking up every day and working your plan. You know, mm-hmm. make your plan, work your plan. You can't control other people. Pick companies that you know, like I said, it's so important, value what you bring to the table. And confrontation is an interesting thing, uh, especially when you're trying to, to rise, you know, as a, as a woman, anytime you speak directly to somebody or there's a lot of sensitivity around, you know, there you go being all aggressive again, mm-hmm. and, you know, a man can say the same thing. So you do have to change your strategy. And I think a lot of people today might think, I just want to be me. Like, I shouldn't have to change who I am. Yeah. Well, you do. I mean, yeah. it, it, because you're just if you think of it as a strategy to get to where I want to go and this person's in between me, why are you going to give that person all the power? Because you just want to, you know, like, no, it's a game. It mm-hmm. is. And the it's confrontation to me. Like, I, I have it, um, you know, yesterday got the best of me. But um, <laughs> I but I generally view confrontation as um not confrontation as something of like just an issue I have to get resolved and when I think of it that way and then I can push past it and move through it and oftentimes I think the difference between those who succeed and those those who don't is like at some point you're like well if I don't care I mean if you don't care and I've brought this to your attention a million times why should I Mm -hmm. you know and then maybe have a day or a week where you're like screw it but then one day you got to get up and suit up and you got to go back and you got to get what you want Mm -hmm. and you know, try a million ways to do it. Like if you're a woman, like, hey, would you mind? You know, here's some cake. You know, you know, I'm going to take you out and beat the shit out of you. Like mm-hmm. you, could, you can try all of the approaches, but never stop trying to advance yourself to where you want to be in life. Because I, I tell people that when they interview for jobs, you know, get even if you think you don't want the job, you're like, get the job. Mm-hmm. Let it be. Get the offer. Let it be your decision not to take it. Mm-hmm. Don't lose an opportunity you know, before it's even offered to you. Like, keep pushing and getting as many opportunities given to you as possible. If you decide not to take them, that's fine. And don't consider conflict oftentimes conflict. Consider it as like, this is just one more, it's like an escape room, just one more door that I got to figure out how to get the key to, Mm -hmm. and I win. Mm -hmm. You know, I win today. I might not (laughs) win tomorrow, but I'll win the day. (laughs) It's exhausting. Yeah, and I I recently got a, um, a job offer, and I was talking to my dad about it, and it just like showed the difference between me and him because both my parents grew up in sales and executive and 
he and I felt bad that I had to leave the job. And he's like, you literally need to think about yourself and think about your path and what you're doing and stop caring so much about what people think. And like every time now I have to make a decision, I'm like, what would my dad do? Yeah. <laughs> because he's such a straight shooter. And I think emotionally and sometimes you do have to kind of pull that back and not use it as much, even though it is helpful in some ways. But um yeah, and I, I think, you know, talking about confrontation, I wanted to discuss the um, post that you wrote for a Huffington Post. Yeah. Um, where you talked about Me Too, but it was interesting because your abuser came forward and apologized. Correct. Which is not very common to see. No. And I think it talks a lot about redemption, but also about you were talking about how people remember things yep. and how it can take time. Yeah, it's it's interesting because um, this is something that happened. I call it the thing before the thing because it hap- <laughs> I left that scenario that's written about in Huffington Post straight into the safety of the Columbian Dark Lord. <laughs> so for me, like that period of my life uh, when that happened, what what, what happened with, with Danny, I, he's a Marine, mm-hmm. um, I was very young, and um, he got a job at a shoe store. I was an adult, Kenny shoe store, mm-hmm. and um, I fell in love with this Marine, and I just, I, you know, I decided I needed to run away from home and move to California and be with him, and my mother was too old to understand what love was, and um, and was trying to squash my life, mm-hmm. and um, so I went, married him, didn't tell my family, and was happy for a little while. Um, I even went to San Diego State University and didn't remember it. He told me just recently. Like, that's p- how my memories were kind of failing me. Mm. But uh, he beat me very badly. And I literally left. I called my mother. She came out. I think I'm the original ghoster. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I, I left, and we never spoke again. Mm. And so as a good Southern uh, mom would do is this is an incident that did not happen. And we will mm. not discuss it mm. ever again because it was shameful for me to have done that. And um, so I just moved on with my life. And I think I say in the article, over the years as I'd pull a credit report, then that name would appear. And so I remembered it. Mm-hmm. But my mother passed away this summer and I found an article. I found her journal. I didn't know she kept a journal. Uh, she typed it and then she printed it out and put it in a folder. Uh, and so I found the folder <laughs> and it had, well, there's a an entry that said Donna ran away from home you know she followed a marine California he beat her I came to get her up that's it and I was like oh yeah that that happened and I told my friend about it my best friend Carrie like a couple weeks later it was really hard for me to say the words and I married him Mm -hmm. like it's like a it's a deep deep shame not that I got married but I guess because I made such a bad mistake and then two weeks later I'm sitting at my living room table with some friends of mine and one of those weird Facebook messages popped up from the non-friend, and mm-hmm. it was him. And he's like, hi, Donna, you know, how are you doing? And my friend said, you like, you just saw a ghost. And I'm like, I, I, I did. did. <laughs> and it took me a minute, and uh, then I had to tell them, and I told them what was going on. And I just said, I'm fine, how are you? And then he came back with a, uh, immediately out of the gate with a big apology. And it was so interesting how my friends a couple of friends, uh, two of my guy friends, we were at Warner Brothers, and when we were leaving, they're like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, oh, nah. no, no, I was explaining what had just happened, and, and both of them were like, you know, fuck that guy. And yeah. I'm like, why? Because I thought how nice that was that he yeah. reached out, right? And he said, because he's trying to get something for himself. You know, he has something he needs to solve for himself, which is so interesting about, like, perceptions of people. Yeah. For me, I felt like, oh, oh wow. Who cares? This is nice that, like, somebody even made an effort to acknowledge what had happened. Mm -hmm. And so we we were messaging, and we didn't talk, and uh, because I wouldn't talk at first. We were messaging, and we kind of, like, we're talking about memories. And there are many things I didn't remember going to San Diego State. Like, you didn't remember hitting me with a helmet. (laughs) You know, like, I don't – I couldn't tell you where we lived. I know the city that we lived in. I almost couldn't tell you the year it happened. So when this was going on with Christine Blasey Ford and people were like, oh, if you don't know where it happened, yeah. it didn't happen. So it was very triggering. But I woke up the next day and I thought, I wonder if he'd be willing to write about this because this is pretty darn special. Because mm-hmm. for me, I didn't understand. I thought he never thought about it a day again in his life. They just beat me and I it left and on. the world went on. Yeah. And I didn't understand that his life could have been affected. 
you know, in whatever ways it was affected. Mm-hmm. And that was fascinating to me. So my premise was, you know, can a guy, a guy in this instance do a bad thing and be a, become a good person? We'll never know. And if he's listening, you know, like, we'll mm-hmm. never know. Is he a good man? Mm-hmm. I choose to believe yes. Um, that's kind of not the point of forgiveness because I don't have to live his life. Uh, he felt bad enough to reach out. Mm-hmm. And um, when I see things like, oh, 60 women signed a piece of paper that said Kavanaugh was a good guy, I'm like, and also there's a show on Discovery ID channel called American Monster, <laughs> where there's always a 55-year-old you know, woman yeah, or man watching a brand new video of their dad giving him a piggyback ride, and he was the best dad in the world, but he killed yeah. 13 people. Yeah, Those two things can live in the world together. And he, I got to say, I said, you know, he didn't know I was a writer. So, you know, he's, I'm like, will you write this article with me? Mm-hmm. And to his credit, he, he did. And it's been really the first time we ever talked on the phone, I probably cried. Mm. half uh, for half the call and my my emotional state was not very very good um and my brother was furious um he came out i have a benefit show at comedy central once a year and um he came out and i told him we were writing this article and my brother got really angry and i was like why are you he's a preacher he's a great guy i'm like Mm. why are you so angry you know preachers are supposed to forgive (laughs) but apparently that night again i didn't remember i got to a phone like while it was happening and just you remembered phone numbers back then yeah i must have dialed my brother in the middle of the night in atlanta mm. and he heard the second half of the beating so for my mm. brother the beating was still very visceral like i don't remember the words and mm. i don't remember the tone i just remember being in the hospital with that tube down my nose to get the blood out of my stomach mm. like that i remember but um what what wound that i had that i didn't really understood stand that I had now I do is when he apologized and we started talking about like why we even got together in the first place and what our life was like and that hole is covered now with the reality of the memories good and bad Mm -hmm. not just shame and fear and distrust something interesting that came from the article I, I was I think I was telling you that I didn't get trolled that much on the article because there was a man saying that he did it. Mm-hmm. And why we don't believe women is, is fascinating to me because there's just no benefit to coming forward with something years later. I had put in the article and they it, and we went a different path towards the end. I said, you know, I could have gone my whole life without telling anybody about Danny. Mm-hmm. But if I turned on the TV one day and saw him being confirmed as a Supreme Court justice, I would have. I would. I would have. Yeah. And that would have been my motivation. Yeah, and that's what upset me so much about the whole Kavanaugh, Dr. Ford thing, because it's like, if you just, like, if you just admit it, like, yeah. like you said, it doesn't automatically make you a horrible person for the rest of your life. No. You can change, and that's what got so frustrating, where they were like, well, he doesn't remember, so it didn't happen. And it's like, that's not really fair. No. <laughs> you know? Yeah. and that's exactly right. If he, you know, it's for me. It's when he was on Fox News and said, you know, I was in Bible class. I wasn't. You know, it's like, yeah. come on, we all know you're a frat guy, and that's okay. Yeah. And we all know you were drunk for three out of four years of college, and that's okay. Yeah. You could just say, I was drunk the whole time. I'm mortified that I could have done this to a woman. I don't remember it, mm-hmm. but God help me if, if I, did I did it. I'm so sorry. And that's he it. came. And it's like I remember when, because I grew up loving Louis C.K. And when all this stuff came out, I was just so upset but there was also another part where he admitted it and said i am a horrible person for doing this Uh, and that that part of that i'm like you know i respect you for doing that and at least like not denying something that actually happened and owning it and just reaching out like the the fact that danny reached out i was very suspect at first because the timing was so weird um like how did you because he apparently been looking for me and um he never had Netflix and he got Netflix one Sunday and he was watching a football documentary that had a football player from Warner Robins, Georgia, which is where I'm from. Mm. And he's like, oh, Warner Robins. So he typed in Donna Thomas, Warner Robins. And Mm. then I came up and he immediately reached out. And it, it, you know, it's, it's really, it's fascinating to me that having these conversations with him, I do feel like I, I remember, you know, for me, what's, hard i got really attacked on facebook over some mm-hmm. of this stuff before the article went out which really shocked me um and i'm like do you really want to go here this is not political it's it's this is not a partisan issue this is not a republican democratic yeah, issue not. you know i've been loved by two men uh two men have loved me in my life one almost beat me to death and the other one 
kill my kid. <laughs> so like, and so, yeah, like these wounds are deep, but because I didn't talk about them for 30 years does not mean they did not happen. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know why we are so resistant mm -hmm. to believing women, but mm -hmm. we would, we care about property more than we care about women. Like mm -hmm. somebody stole my car. I believe you. Yeah. Somebody stole my computer. I believe you. Yeah. And even Somebody raped me. Oh, did they? Yeah. Like, how many drinks did he have? And yeah. it, even with Bill Cosby and stuff, people still think he's innocent. People still think and I'm he's like, innocent. Oh, my God. Like, he was literally proving guilty. Yeah. Like, he was drugging and raping women yeah. for years. <laughs> and it's, it's hard. And I think that, like, I know that it affects people the way they see men as a whole sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that can be a little hard. But, I mean, when you see other girls like coming forward with stories like this and they get, you know, trolled by all these guys. Like what is your advice to them to kind of move past it? I think that I've thought a lot about that. Um, when you're speaking your truth, as you speak your truth, the person isn't hearing your truth. They're hearing their truth. Hmm. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like it's a filter that's going in and there's like literally, whether it's your aunt or some idiot mm -hmm. online that is behind a name that is an idiot name, you know, or a coworker. Um, you can't control it, but that doesn't mean it's not going to affect you. Mm -hmm. I would say feel it and move on because you can't let somebody who doesn't have any impact in your life control like how you live your life and how you move forward and how you heal because mm -hmm. that's really what's important and it's easier said than done I mean you know like you read a comment and you're like really mm -hmm. and then you you obsess over it like crazy but at the same time I think you know I had my philosophy is as you go through life things come up that it's it's what integrity is to me things come up and you you're like that doesn't feel right for me that doesn't feel right for me to cross that line mm -hmm. and and then you make a stand or you tell your story or you tell your truth and if you can tolerate the backlash or the consequence that comes from it then you're standing in your own integrity and mm -hmm. if that's okay with you then you did the right thing mm -hmm. and if it feels too much then you can you can back off of it and but some of the people that we've known that have come out against people that are famous, I mean, they take some really serious hits and death threats and, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. And is there healing from coming forward? I mean, Christine Blasey Ford is a perfect example. How does she feel today? Yeah. What we taught Amer young women just this month or last month in this country, we taught them do not speak up. Mm -hmm. That's what we just taught American women. Mm -hmm. Do not speak up. Mm -hmm. But – we should speak up if it feels right to you. If not, then get, you know, kind of get help privately or talk to somebody mm -hmm. privately and you don't have to make it public. A lot of people have been sharing their personal stories. I wasn't expecting this of abuse after the article came out and, and which is great. And I'm not necessarily equipped to, to handle it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but being there for somebody who reaches out to tell their, tell their truth, you know, if individual people, we can say, you know, support that person. Yeah. Don't question that person, especially if you're a man <laughs> and you're listening. Yeah. Do not think that you have something to offer this woman as an answer because you don't. Mm -hmm. Just listen. listen. Yeah. And I think that a big theme of everything we've been talking about, like even in business and even in dealing with personal issues, is that as a woman, it is okay to speak out and speaking up is is something that you can do and that it's okay in every situation mm -hmm. and so i think that's definitely something i've learned even just talking to you for what 30 minutes we've been talking um and i think it's very helpful to see that you know it's okay for someone to come forward and that there can be healing from that even if it's with other women who come to you mm -hmm. you know and yep. and i hope the article you know because they had asked us at some point to one of the edit piece of edits, uh, like for him, what do you think coming forward? Do you think this will help change opinions or change the world in any way? And his answer was like, I just wanted to apologize to Donna. Like, I mm -hmm. don't think anything I have to say will change anybody's opinion on. Mm -hmm. There's so much broken, you know, but I don't agree with that. I think that 
the story should tell you a couple of things. It should tell you if you feel the need, you feel bad about something you've done in life, don't hesitate to reach out. Mm -hmm. Conversely, don't have expectations of what that reach out is going to mean because they could just absorb it and you'd never, never answer you or, you know, be angry and be like, get away from it. You know, Mm -hmm. that's not the point. The point is you doing what feels right for you and you, that's him standing in his truth. Mm -hmm. You know, I need to find her. I need to apologize. Half of the world thinks that that's bullshit Mm -hmm. and it kind of doesn't matter. Yeah. Because I don't think it's bullshit Mm -hmm. and it's the person who beat me. Mm -hmm. So truly that's what healing is. Yeah. To me. (sighs) Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, everything you've been saying, it's just been so powerful. And I'm really thankful that you were here today and you could come on not only to talk about this, but to talk about business and to talk about just being a woman and being strong. And um, I before we go, I just want to see, you know, where can people find you if they want to connect or. Oh, um, I am. uh at Best of Donna Crafts Platform. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, best of Donna. Um, yeah. Cool. And then, like, we, we didn't get to uh, the foundation, but I will oh, yes. say, I, will say I, I have a foundation, and I give uh, we give out scholarships to women uh, at UCB. We give out about $8,000 a year mm. in uh, scholarship money. But the importance to that is, like, I started a scholarship way back, you know, when I was at Discovery Channel, and I only did it – I wanted to give back. So my – I would like to encourage people that you don't have to have money. You don't have to, like, you know, I don't have a tr- – I'm some idiot from South Georgia. Like, I, this is <laughs> – I have no uh, – you know, I'm nobody special. So as long as you, you know, take a look at what you can do in the world, whether it's volunteering or – for me, it was like, can I change maybe one person's life? Is that okay? Mm-hmm. You know, is life changing to get a comedy scholarship? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But – Um, I would always be looking for a way that if you want to give back to the world, and for me, it's like women don't necessarily treat women well in the business world. Mm -hmm. And this was my way of thinking maybe at some point I can create a a group that women, if they're helped, that they can reach back and help. And there's enough room at the top for everyone. Um, But no matter how you and your financial situation or your time situation is, you can always find a way that works for you to do what you believe in and to give back in a way that is meaningful to you. So I would encourage anybody to, from a volunteer standpoint, whether it be money or whether it be time, make that a part of who you are and make that a part of your mission in life to succeed because it will give back to you in so many ways that you didn't know and you will be a much more I sound like I'm preaching, but a much more well-rounded person. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you sure. so much. Thank you for thank having you me. Thank you, guys. Please let me know how you feel in the comments. This is wonderful. Um, and I guess we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.